evening and welcome to Money Matters. I'm David Ebner from Merrill Lynch and with me this evening is Charlie Shields from Wells Fargo Advisor. Hey Charlie, good, good seeing to see you again. You, David. Well, Charlie, we have an exciting show. We're going to learn a lot about uh, crowdfunding and other ways to raise capital uh, for small business owners and maybe me medium-sized business owners. Um, but a lot's happened in the market since we last talked. Uh, is there any good places to invest right now? Well, you know, that's always a great question. And uh, one way to answer it is to look back, let's say, over the last year or two or three and say, what's gone down and what's gone up. And over the last two or three years, without uh, trying to time the show for our viewers and listeners, uh, this is taped and so any opinions we express, uh, you should check with your own financial advisor. Also, we're not attorneys and we're not accountants, so don't, uh, don't rely on us for any information in, in those theaters. But when you look back over the last two or three years, the United States markets have gone up a lot. And for example, emerging markets have gone down a lot. Interesting. And Europe is somewhere in between. So if I just take that perspective, I would say this probably is not a bad time to be starting to nibble on some emerging markets. Everybody has decided, based on the rearview mirror, that the United States is the only place to invest. Right. So maybe emerging markets is a place to look at, maybe Europe. The developed markets are doing overseas are doing better so far than emerging markets. But that's one way to try to analyze where should you invest. Yeah, it's always sound and prudent advice to tell people to buy low, right? And yeah. so that's it, it's very prudent. What about the housing market? Rates are going up. Actually, last time you and I talked, we talked about uh, bond prices coming down and rates are going to come up. And it's just a matter of if or when, not uh, if. And, well, here we are. Rates are going up. Is that hurting the housing market? Well, it is in the short run. I get a chuckle out of hearing people say, well, I've missed it. <laughs> because uh, mortgages are at four and five eighths right now. And you think back seven, eight, nine years ago, people would say, gosh, I wish I'd been in the situation that my parents were in in the 50s where they could get a 5% mortgage. Right. You know, so then we have a couple of years when the economy's in real trouble and people were able to get three and five eighths or they caught the very bottom, maybe a three and three eighths 30 right. year mortgage. Right. And now it's at four and five eighths which historically is a wonderful low rate. Absolutely. So I think as some of these part-time workers start to get a full-time job, as both spouses get a job, and they finally get around to saying, we finally got the wherewithal to buy a house, I think they'll take another look at a four and five-eighths rate and say, maybe it's not too late. Let's go ahead and get a four and five-eighths mortgage and and let's get the tax break on it if it still exists and all that sort of thing. We have to watch out for. We're not we're not lawyers. We're not tax advisors, <laughs> but you have to be aware of those type of things when you make the investment, right? Low hanging fruit. You're saying it's going to disappear. It's very possible. Absolutely. Yeah. With the uh, interest rates going up, absolutely. I, I I chuckle too. You know, at cocktail parties and stuff when people say, "Oh, the rates are climbing." Yes, they're going up from their bottoms, but they're still historically very low. And uh, you know, if you can get something, you know, especially when you amortize it over 30 years, it's almost a rounding error for most people. So again, if, 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 the longer the perspective, the better the uh, the uh, the uh, execution, if you will. So. Sure. And then the other thing is, if you really wanted to have a three and five eighths or three and three quarters rate, get a 15-year mortgage. The payments are higher, but. but over the life of the loan, you're paying a lot less, and if it's affordable, if you can handle the payments, you can still get a very low interest rate. Right. Obviously, many options that people need to look into, uh, absolutely. But I do like the idea of going fixed versus variable, because I do too. rates are not going down, I don't believe, in the, in the near term. Well, that, that brings us into a discussion about the, who's the next Fed chairman and all that sort of thing. You've got all this uncertainty that if you get a dove, by a dove, I mean a person who will leave interest rates low to try to make uh, politics look good for the incumbents and all that sort of thing. Uh, the danger there is inflation can come roaring back, and you don't know whether that's going to happen. And when you don't know, as you say, get a fixed rate that's, that's reasonable, reasonably low based on history, and then you know what you've got. Right. And you can get this teaser type of thing for a couple of years, but then when you get ready to roll it over, who knows whether it might be a five and a half or six percent mortgage for all we know. Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny you made that comment. I thought the Fed was not part of the political system. 
Well, uh, the one part of it that is political is the fact that the President of the United States gets to select the next chairman. Excellent point. It does. There is, so, there's that. <laughs> so, so you, know, you talked about the markets going up in the USPs are probably around 14 right now. Is that too high, too low? Well, um, there's a rule of thumb that works in, until it doesn't work, but it's pretty good if you look over the long haul of 20 minus the inflation rate is what the, quote, proper p price to earnings ratio is. And if you believe that inflation is 2 or 3 percent right now, maybe our economy could handle a 17 price to earnings ratio. And if you have a climb from 14 times earnings to 17 times earnings, if that turns out to be correct, sure. that's another 20 percent market gain. Right. Now, I've seen times that uh, priced earnings in 1974, they were at eight times earnings because we had the Vietnam War, sure. we had impeachment, yep. we had all kinds of problems. Inflation, uh, right. The nation was uh, infighting Civil about the, the war yep. and it was, it was just horrible and PEs were at eight. So I can't tell you for sure that 14 is low, but it's probably in the middle of the range we've been in over the long haul and uh, if things stay under, if inflation stays under control, we could see a nice improvement in the price to earnings ratio up to 17 times earnings. Yeah, I, I would piggyback on that by saying that investors should also look at what companies are doing. Companies are buying back their stock. They're, they're increasing their dividends. So they have the cash and they're obviously, we haven't seen the acquisitions happen, but they're probably going to happen right around the corner. But right now they're buying back stock and that's going to increase your earnings by less outstanding shares. It's that simple, right? Sure, and, and you have a lot of people working part-time because of uncertainty about the uh, Affordable Care Act and all this sort of thing. And once that haze clears, perhaps they'll start hiring full-time workers and full-time workers because God knows they need more help. People are being, their fingers are being worked to the bone, the people that are with corporations now. And you could see a surge in demand for products as new workers come online that are getting paid full -time, for full-time sure. jobs. So. Uh, a lot, of, a lot of things could happen in the future that would take that price to earnings ratio from 14 to 17, create more consumers, higher taxes, less of a need to increase uh, taxes because taxes would go up just from the fact that there's more workers paying the taxes. So there is an optimistic scenario that we can look for out there and hope for, but we have to be paying attention over the next couple of years as things unfold. Absolutely. A good idea. So uh, speaking of the future, where's gold going or the dollar? Well, I think gold and the dollar and the 30-year bond are the three vigilantes. And so we were talking earlier about whether or not someone is going to be coming the next chairman of the mm -hmm. Fed who's going to allow inflation to come back. Well, the clues that I'm going to get from whether inflation is coming back is gold soaring up through 1900 and climbing higher? Or is it staying where it is or dropping? Is the 30-year bond going to go up through 5%, heading to 6 or 7? God forbid, back where it was in the Carter era in 1979, where it was 16%. Uh, the dollar, will the dollar plummet because confidence is being lost in the United States? So those three vigilantes are going to answer the question. Right now, my guess is that gold will not be making new highs. But if the wrong people get in uh, and are, are allowing inflation to come back, then all bets are off on that statement. Yeah. So be vigilant is what you're saying. It's yeah. probably prudent advice. And, and watch those indicators. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's great. Uh, always good information. And we do have a, uh, a question of the week, if you can tackle that before we all get right. to our guests. And this comes from Thomas Long of Exton, PA. He says, what's the difference between a market order trade and a specific price and time trade? Well, it's very quick and easy to tell you the difference, but then we need to talk to, to uh, our viewers and listeners a little bit about that. The, the exact price that a stock is trading at, if you say, I want to buy at the market, then you'll put in your order and whatever it's trading at at that time is the price you'll get. If you think that a stock is due to come back down a little bit and you want to own it but not at that price, you can put a limit order in and say, if that stock drops down to a certain price below where it is now, I want to buy it at that time. You can do that during the day, which is a day order, or you can do it for 180 days with my firm, which is a good till canceled order. The thing I want to warn viewers and listeners about, though, is if you put in a market order and you put it in overnight, 
and some good news comes out about a stock, that stock could jump 10 points at Absolutely. the opening and you own it 10 points higher than when you were having the conversation. So you have to be careful. And also there are limit orders that you can put in for stops. If you own a stock and you want to protect yourself, you put a stop limit order in or you put a stop. And there's a difference there. The stop limit means if it hits that price, you want to get out at that price if you can. But if the stop is an automatic market order as soon as it hits your stop, if it's dropping fast, you might get out at a lower price. Right. So there's a lot to understand that's that's deeply embedded behind the question that was asked. No, it's it's a, a great answer, and I think uh, it's just as Charlie said earlier. This it's important to talk to your financial advisor uh, before making any trades. That's for sure. Um, but if you have a, a question for us, please send it in to Money Matters at 205 East Leving Mill Road, Ballakinwood, PA 19004 or moneymatterstv at gmail.com. Our guest today is uh, David Drake, and he's from the Soho Loft uh, in New York City. And welcome to the show, David. Well, thank you, David. Pleasure Good to, to see here, you, Charles. David. Thanks for being here. Um, so tell us a little bit about your background, a little bit about the Soho Loft. Yeah, well, I've been practicing my background for a while now. So the Soho Loft started about two years ago. Okay. Uh, it really started 10 years ago when I actually had a loft in Seoul. There you go. A seven bedroom bachelor living in the loft in Manhattan. <laughs> it was wow. amazing. That is <laughs> amazing. Little did I know then. Yeah. But um, we recreated the Seoul loft in 2011 for our uh, private equity advisory group to bring on family offices and investor, institutional investors together. It was the same time as you know the congressional elections were going on in D.C. So we were getting fresh content from subcongressional witnesses. And suddenly, we're doing these events all over the U.S. several times a month. And uh, I become an expert on private equity, venture capital, angel networks, crowdfunding, we'll talk about today. But a lot of this is around small, medium-sized business owners. And how can they get cash now when you know banks and venture capital firm has been decimated after the great financial crisis? So today, the Soho Loft that we're running is focused on writing. We write for about 40 magazines. I write for Forbes and Thomson Reuters on a regular basis. Okay. Thomson Reuters asked me to do institutional events with them in the past, three conferences that we did. And we also uh, have conferences that we produce, sponsor, and manage on a regular basis, several of them a month. So for small business owners, you know, um, maybe we have 50 events a year nationwide, focus on angel investors and venture capitalists. And they just want to meet small owners and startups. So that's one venue that has become the age of angels today. Okay. Because before the crisis, we had 2,700 VCs. Right. Right after October uh, 2008, they there were only 400 <laughs> active. Yeah. Banks stopped lending right away. Sure. So they have become an age of, age of angels, and it's really taking off. I mean, I covered the Angel Capital Association's largest event in San Francisco four months ago. The largest ever, 650 people from all over the world. And, you know, new countries that hasn't really evolved much in, on the site are increasing. And, you know, it's hitting $22 billion this year. The last year was $22 billion from angels. And venture capitalists were all about the same size, $25 billion. And, you know, there's only 268,000 angels last year. So the new law in the Jobs Act, the most powerful one uh, that we're going to talk about as well before we get to crowdfunding, is you're allowed to advertise for investors. It hasn't been allowed since 1933 SEC Act. Right. After 80 right. years, you're allowed now to advertise right. for investors, but you have to be SEC compliant. So obviously right. you should talk to a lawyer, you should talk to a platform who understands this. But this is tremendous. If I want to give you some numbers, in 2011, there were about $968 billion that SEC disclosed in public offerings in the U.S. Uh, Reg D506, very complicated formula. It's the most common way to raise money privately for funds and companies. That one was $895 billion, almost the same size. Right. So we're talking about a, a potential $1.5 trillion market being affected where you can advertise. And that is exciting. Yeah, obviously it's exciting when you can go out and get a multiple, the average investor, if you will. Uh, investing in angel uh, investing, uh, but you, you spent some time in Milan and Istanbul and Athens. What did you learn about capital formation there? Well, they're all 
Because they're I, emerging yes. areas, yeah. right? They're emerging markets. Yep. Europe is very active. Yep. I was invited by the US, U.S. Commerce Department to be representative to Brussels and Rome last okay. summer to talk about SME policy, small and medium-sized enterprise policy, and how things are working here as well as working over there and which products will be changed. And they're a little behind us, and they're always going to be behind us. I believe so because they have cultural and language issues. Okay. Angel, for instance, in Europe. They have a hard time investing in Germany if they're from France. <laughs> the exception <laughs> would be if they were working in a conglomerate. It's the borders, right? right? The yeah. borders are the problem. Yeah. So they need to understand the accounting and the culture. Right. And that inherent challenge is always going to be there. Right. So their, uh, you know, their angel network investment is around $6 billion. The U.S. is 22 now. So they're trying to implement our laws so they can have a better... Uh, some formation? countries, some okay. countries are, but that's taking even longer. Okay. And it's not. Uh, I, I did cover the Italian law for crowdfunding. Okay. So I broke the news in English. I waited for an Italian financial magazine to write it. <laughs> I translated it. I had the lawyers. I had a copy of it from the SEC uh, equivalent, and I broke the news globally on that. Um, they're all looking to the U.S., and the U.K. is really the strongest market okay. for early stage companies. It's because U.K. does something unique. You can deduct your investment in an SEIS company that's qualified, 50% against your salary. Really? 50% against your personal salary. And that's why small businesses there are flourishing because they're like, wait a minute, I can deduct 50%. So, you know, we don't have that in the U.S. per se, but we have other a things. Absolutely not. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I understand that, you know, you guys are going to be giving advice to small, medium-sized businesses. Mm -hmm. Right. And these new areas of crowdfunding that I haven't talked about yet and the new law where they can advertise, you know, they're going to come and trust you both and yeah. say, hey, we heard about this. What can we do? And you're going to be in a very powerful position to do what the banks have not done. Right. The banks have not been able to step in. They've been, you know, dealing with the fact that they couldn't resolve. So the new players on the block, the angels, the crowdfunding technology is coming in and it's not leaving. Well, David, let's take this from the view overview above to specifics. If we have an entrepreneurial uh, listener or viewer who's thinking about trying to do something, they have this great idea, uh, talk us through an optimistic scenario of what could happen, how you could help them, and, and how quickly they could make things happen. Just give us an idea of what you could do for someone. Well, you know, we write a lot to educate investors and entrepreneurs to show them what is possible and what the challenges are. I think going to an angel network to pitch mm -hmm. is the best thing for us investors in the world. It brings their expectations down because they're going to see questions asked to other entrepreneurs and they'll realize what they're missing in their own plan. We often, as investors like myself, you know, entrepreneurs might say, well, it's worth $10 million. It's right. my napkin. I'm like, really? Right. Right. But when they go to these events, they start seeing other entrepreneurs. They'll meet face-to-face -face with you know, recognizable venture capitalists and angels. And we show them on the site who they are so they can research, research the firms before they go to an event. So it's not a guessing game. Okay. So that's one way. But if you're going to go even before then, you know, they need to have a two-page executive summary. Yeah. You know, I worked with Adia in the Middle East, in Abu Dhabi, the world's largest sovereign wealth fund. And they tell me, David, this is how we want to look at a two-page executive summary. Right. You know, we want it to look like this because we get a hundred of them a month, mm -hmm. just our little division. Of course. Or we give them. And it's been my experience that they want to see an awareness of cash burn, that you're showing some milestones along the way and showing that you, you want to prove this can work before the investor puts more money in and awareness of that and not just keep spending your money until my <laughs> idea works, right? Of course, yes, I agree with you, Charles. Yeah. And you know, you know, I have a friend in uh, New York, quite a few of them, you know, one is a super angel, somebody who invests a lot, he sure. likes to invest $100,000 per startup, he invested in 20 of them, the last 15 years, that's all he does. Okay. He goes to office to office, that's his life. Mm -hmm. So you know, the nice with angels is they all have their own criteria, sure. some of them will have that, some won't. Venture capitalists, they're more there for the business. Yeah. Yeah. They'll do more of what you're saying. The angels will do it for more of passionate reasons. Okay. You know, they might like the youth of the entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. They like the idea. They want to learn. You know, some people just do it because they don't know anything. Some right. people just do it because their friend invested. Right. So it, it, it's a little more of chaos, but right. it's organized under an angel associ association in the U.S. as well abroad. And back to your question, Istanbul, when I was speaking there, you know, they've seen almost 100% growth in entrepreneurial investments yeah. the last couple of years. And I spoke for the European Business Angel Network. 
Well, as Charlie was saying earlier, uh, obviously the emerging markets, as they catch on to capitalism and how it works and what the benefits of capitalism, it is going to explode, right? Uh, I think we were talking earlier about China, if you have a million people in your city, it doesn't even show up on the radar, right? right. That, so that, that's powerful, right? You, you back that up with capitalism and all the things you're talking about. But let, let, let's talk about crowdfunding. You know, I, I've seen it, I've read about it, uh, especially in the Hollywood, it's gotten a lot of press here. Yes. Is that a, a future, is it just a flash in the pan? Uh, the technology is here. The word's being abused. My definition, and I write so much, I deconstruct what's happening with private equity funds and crowdfunding funds in different countries. And I look at the regulatory la landscape. So to me, crowdfunding is anytime you make a payment online towards one cost, product, service, or, or product. Uh, uh, yeah, those things, okay. experience. Yeah. Through the computer, I consider that crowdfunding. With a caveat, that it doesn't matter how much money or little money you have making the payments. Okay. That's where it gets gray here. <laughs> Everybody's using crowdfunding. Right. You know, hedge funds are using crowdfunding. Right. I have a column on Hedgeco, a hedge fund line. I write for them too. But everybody's starting to use it. And you would really need to understand it, how it works everywhere. And many of them are broker dealers. Yeah. They're just not <laughs> crowdfunding. Because the idea is, look, I have a credit investors in a little box. It's really crowdfunding. I'm emailing them. They're accredited. They invest. It's okay. Mm -hmm. But in my scope of crowdfunding, it's for anybody to put money in. And that's the issue. It's been a challenge being with the SEC, you know, because it's, we have such a legacy issue for the 33, 34, and 40 Act right. that we now have to deal with something that didn't exist then, the Internet. <laughs> TV didn't exist. Right. And it's all brand new. Right. So it is. So how are they going to regulate that? Because that's what I was going to piggyback on. We're how waiting. do you regulate it? We're still waiting. Italy passed it, but it's not practical. UK has been running it, but it's not a new law yet, using exemptions. Right. Uh, Sweden, Norway, uh, Sweden, Denmark, uh, Holland, you know, even Hong Kong and Singapore are using exemptions. Italy passed the first law, but it's not practical yet. Right. Just because they haven't doesn't mean that you can just go and do it. US was supposed to have it passed January 1st. It's going to be delayed quite a while, and when it passes, it still has challenges because we don't know what the rules going to be. But we've been working with some of the association with the SEC on a, regular, on a weekly basis, talking to them, you know, evolving, you know, the challenges that are there. Right. And, um, and well, I think it will be powerful on the equity side. Right. But if we talk about rewards, rewards is you don't get the stock. Right. And you know, That's Pebble Watches has the world record. Eleven million dollars. Ten what, point what's two. Pebble Watches. It's a watch connected to your cell phone. Okay. So when it rings. Or your iPad, you can wa look at your watch to see <laughs> who's calling. Okay. And they walked into my event May 9th in 2012 in, in Pablo Alto, and they're saying, we're winding down our campaign. We couldn't raise 100000 with angels. But online, in less than 30 days, we ra raised $10.2 million. Wow. And what was interesting was that a year later, not less than a year, nine months later or ten months later, uh, Charles River, River Ventures in S Silicon Valley gave them another investment of $15 million. Wow. And it took them nine months to deliver their watch, mm -hmm. even though they promised six. Right. Okay, so the crowdfunding, uh, I guess the difficulty is, has someone really been taken advantage of right. if they put a small amount of money in and a business fails? And, and the idea with an angel investor, they're supposed to be sophisticated and they have more money, and so therefore you have to you can say you have to be qualified in some certain way to invest as an angel investor. Talk a little bit about the angel investors and when they do put their money in, uh, are these extremely wealthy people? Is this focused in New York? Because that's where the the empire of money is in the, in the United States or is it is it growing rapidly all over the country or all over the world? Well, interestingly enough, you know, Silicon Valley is string, still is almost the center of venture capital. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to angel networks, uh, we, you have them nationwide. However, in New York, the last year, we've seen an explosion of activity for startups okay. and angel investors and early stage angels that we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, offices that are being shared are popping up left and right, and they're sold out, all rented out. And, you know, a lot of organizations in Europe have moved to the U.S. because there is a history here and versus the rest of the world that hey we're used to using credit cards and having debt and spending more we ha we're used to you know donating more money and you know a lot of crowdfunders that I've advised and worked with 
three, four of them have actually moved their offices to New York and Silicon Valley the last two years because it just takes so much energy to explain something to somebody who doesn't want to be explained to in their home country. Sounds but, like the sure winner is going to be the real estate owner uh, <laughs> leasing these places the, out. The Soho Loft, right? That's what it sounds like. I, I yeah, the real loft. There you go. <laughs> the real loft. That's my secret sauce. I'm going to have a real loft again. <laughs> he, owns, he owns a city block. That's his secret sauce. Well, obviously you talked about crowdfunding. You, you, you study alternative uh, financing and financing. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that and uh, is it growing? Is it it's changing? What's the hurdles in it? Well, because we saw the VCs decimate and we saw banks stopping to lend, what's everybody going to do? Right. It's been rather chaotic. Yeah, so alternative absolutely. financing has been the topic of everybody's mind, but I haven't really seen anybody, you know, display it properly or in an efficient way. But I do think, you know, the conferences are good. Conferences for entrepreneurs, you know, physical, like we're doing face-to-face, -face, explaining, you know, how do you do this? What are the steps? And also letting the entrepreneurs get a real life VC angel sitting there in the public, criticizing them on the spot. Right. It's very efficient. And I think more and more uh, events become important right now. But we're seeing a digital era where things have been educated online. And the crowdfunding phenomena is being implemented by hedge funds, by private equity funds. I wrote for Tom Storch about that, right. as well as for angel networks. And in Europe, we're seeing an interesting thing. I just wrote an article how angels take the lead in crowdfunding platforms. Interesting. And they're saying, we're not going to do this deal. The angel will negotiate the terms. And after that, you will follow in line after their terms. Excellent. And that is something I've been talking about for two years. I think it's angels who take the lead in the U.S. too and elsewhere. That gives a comfort factor. And you're right. The problem here is this is private businesses. It's not public. Ninety-five percent of these companies are going to fail. fail. Absolutely. And you know you have a couple and fail, and people start screaming fraud. And it's not. <laughs> it's, it's just a failure. A failure. Yeah, right. So it's an evil. Ba it's a difficult balance that we have discussing between the groups talking with the SEC, the people in the industry, and not only in crowdfunding. Like you know, it is non-accredited investor potential in this new law if it, when it becomes law legal. Nine percent, nine percent of these deals going to fail. How do you deal with that? Yeah. And the platforms are not set up to deal with that because it's not legal yet. Right. But when it becomes legal, now on the rewards part, they have, you know, right now maybe 50% of campaigns get their money. Sure. That's really high. And that's why the, some of the, you know, Kickstarter is the biggest in the world. Right. They did 274 right. million last year. And, but they've had success. That's why they're. Yeah. That's why it's 50%. Yeah. And there's a thousand sites today doing crowdfunding, actually more than that. So it's a lot of noise, and it's going to be exemplified by these new laws. I noticed you were involved with this Champions of Change event at the White House. That sounds pretty interesting. Can you tell me a little bit about what happened this summer with this event? Yes, the White House invited me to go to the Champions of Change event. They had identified a, cu a couple um, startups that they wanted to acknowledge mm -hmm. as champions. Unfortunately, I was with my father in Down Under. Uh, Australia and New Zealand speaking oh. at six conferences. Oh, okay. So they gave me a rain check and I did follow up on that rain check a couple of times. So I've been in constant communication with the White House since. So it's been an honor to be able to be invited to that event. Okay, that's great. Great. So with all these alternative investment or alternative investing if you will, do you see small banks going out of business here? Oh no, not at, not at all. You actually see right now crowdfunding happening but with debt microfinancing okay you know lending club i don't know if you heard of it but you know they have uh, john mack from the former ceo of uh, morgan stanley on the board of directors okay they're going to hit 2 billion dollars in peer to peer loans they're up to 35,000 dollars that you can loan online uh, that's fantastic against consumer loans so sm small banks are using that debt side of things to extend loans and that's already active uh, no, uh, small banks will always be core of the communities. Well, that's good to know. And um, unfortunately, Dave, we've run out of time. And mm -hmm. as I told you, we'd go fast. Um, yeah. But uh, it was great information. Our next week's guest is Richard Sitchell. He's the CIO of Philadelphia Trust Company, and he'll tell us what's new and exciting in the trust. And until next time, your money matters. Mm -hmm.